Uh, so again, thank you for joining us this evening for our Great Lakes Dynamic Forest webinar. This is a, a first webinar of a series of three. Um, my name is Linnea Rouse. I work for American Bird Conservancy as the Great Lakes Private Lands Director. And American Bird Conservancy is a nonprofit organization focused on bird conservation throughout the Americas. And uh, if you can see my screen here, just to kind of show um, American Bird Conservancy's footprint is throughout North, Central, and South America. And here in the Great Lakes region, we are primarily focused on the conserving habitat for bird species of concern component. This webinar is part of a three-part webinar series and um, focusing on forestry for birds and wildlife in the Great Lakes region. Um, American Bird Conservancy is hosting this series with the goal of introducing the dynamic forest concept in the Great Lakes region to discuss the benefits of active forest management for forest health and for birds and wildlife, and to share information on cost share funding for private lands forestry projects in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. We hope to reach a diverse audience, including foresters, forest workers, biologists, natural resource managers, landowners, and anyone who engages with land management or use of forest land for recreation or enjoyment. This webinar series and the related private lands programs in the Great Lakes region are funded by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. So today we have presentations on forest disturbance, both from a historical perspective and how active forest management today is diversifying the forested landscape structure through sustainable and ecological forestry practices. So before our presenters get started, I'd like to introduce the American Bird Conservancy staff who are involved in the webinar series and with private lands forestry projects in the Great Lakes. So we have um, uh, five foresters here with American Bird, Bird Conservancy. And in addition, we have uh, guest speaker, Jeff Flurkin, um, but I'll start with our American Bird Conservancy foresters. So we have Jack Haven, who is a, a private lands forester based in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Uh, we have Dwayne Fogard, a forester in, in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, we have Pat Weber, a wildlife habitat specialist in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Myself also in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. And we have Michael Paling, a forester in Marquette, Michigan. Uh, and Jeff Larkin, who is our other guest speaker, is with American Bird Conservancy and the Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and he is a professor and a forest bird habitat advisor. Um, finally, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, if you are having any technical issues, such as with your sound, please use the chat feature to send a message to one of us Zoom hosts. And if you have questions for the presenters, please use the Q&A button. This will allow all participants to see your questions and for us to answer the questions either in writing or have our presenters or panelists answer questions following the presentations. This webinar is being recorded and we will share a publicly accessible link soon after the webinar. And finally, if you're interested in receiving continuing education credits for attending this webinar, we will collect your information via a Zoom poll after the two presentations are finished. So stick around until the end for that, please. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to um, unshare my screen and Dwayne, you can go ahead and get your presentation up and running. Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome everybody. Uh, so I'm what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna real quickly go through about 12,000 years of history here in about 15 minutes. So it's going to be uh, really quick and dirty, but uh, it'll kind of give us the background for, for Jeff Lars Larkin's talk and then and then going forward through the rest of the webinars. Um, so I'm going to start with the glaciation. Uh, you can see from the map that, you know, the vast majority of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota were covered by glaciers multiple times, except for, of course, the famous Driftless area. And the most recent one, the Wisconsin glaciation, started about 100,000 years ago and ended 10 to 12,000 years ago, you know, depending on which area you're talking about. Uh, it ended, you know, farther back in time, the farther south you were, generally speaking. 
Okay, and basically right after the glaciers left, people arrived. Um, I don't know if you can read this, but it's from an article about a, a professor doing an archeological study up on Knife Lake in Northern Minnesota on the Canadian border, where they found a, a stone quarry from people uh, mining stone to make arrowheads and spearheads and stuff like that. And they've dated it to about 10 or 11,000 years ago. So pretty quickly, right after the ice left, there was people here already. So when people talk about forests in the Great Lakes and, and bringing them back to, to pre-human influence, they're talking about this. This is what <laughs> this area looked like when human beings got here. It was tundra. So, you know, the, the people were here before the forest was. So that's, a I think, an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, and the people did things to manage the landscape to make it better for their uses. You know, one of the main things they did was they used fire to uh, make it the understory and forests and places like that more open so they could travel through them and to uh, get young growth that the you know the deer and elk and stuff like that that they wanted to hunt wanted was eating so it would attract game that they were interested in and uh, they also did it to manage plants like blueberries and stuff like that for food sources so they used fire a lot and we can tell that by you know the oral history that we've that's been brought down from them and then uh, also the history of early explorers and then uh, studies that have been done this is a study that was done in Itasca State Park in north central Minnesota and uh, they looked at tree rings and fire scars on old trees and stumps and they were able to cover a period from 1712 to 1913 and during that period they found there was a fire somewhere in the park on average every 8.8 .8 years and a major fire every 10.3 years and that any one spot in the park burned over about every 21 years on average so that's a lot of fire and there's been uh, similar studies done in the boundary waters and at the cloquet forestry center and other places that have found uh, similar results that you know, there was a lot of fire on the landscape and a lot of it was being set by Native Americans for management purposes. Okay, so this is a kind of a good quote that I like from John Staggerwalt with the Rough Grouse Society, that uh, many forest ecosystems in North America are just as dependent on the forces of fire as an ecological lifeblood as the rainforests of South America are dependent upon rain. Okay, another thing there was was beavers. Um, prior to the big uh, beaver trapping days, in, you know, kind of the big fur trapping days started about the late 1600s, 1670 or so. Prior to that, there it was estimated there was 100 to 200 million beavers in North America. So in comparison now, they believe there's about 15 to 20 million. So there was 10 times as many beavers roughly back then as there is now. And so you can really imagine, you know, the effect that had on the landscape as they they made their ponds and and harvested trees and and then the eventually moved on and the and the ponds drained and and then filled in with vegetation and and uh you know rinse and repeat. Okay, so you know, many of you have probably heard of the idea of succession, where uh you know you you start off after a disturbance or or after the glaciers left or something and, and you know you have plants that come in maybe grasses and herbs and stuff at first and then brush and various kinds of trees and and over time you know different kinds of trees move in and and there's wildlife that's adapted to all those different stages and so you know what what ended up happening with all this disturbance on the landscape was wildlife adapted to different stages of succession and that kind of tells us that there was a mosaic of of different ages and types of forest um you know we can tell that just by the wildlife you know if you look in the lower left hand corner that's a golden wing warbler that nests in young forest and brushland and uh upper left is a black and white warbler 
they nest in a little bit older forest, what we call a forest that's in the stem exclusion phase when the, the trees are starting to compete with each other and, and some of them are dying. And then upper right is a black-throated blue warbler. Uh, they use forests that are in what we call understory reinitiation, so a little bit older forest yet. And then uh, Canada warbler in the lower right, which uses older forest. So, you know, if all those different habitats didn't exist on the landscape, we wouldn't have wildlife that's adapted to that. Okay, so then when, uh, you know, European settlements started, um, one of the first things that happened in this area was was people came in and started logging the big pines. Uh, you know, depending on where you are, that started at different times. Lower Peninsula of Michigan, well, between the three states, the Lower Peninsula of Michigan had started first in in the 1840s, 1850s, and it started fairly quickly after that in Wisconsin. And uh, then it kind of moved north and west. Um, the the big logging days were were pretty much over in Michigan by the, the 1890s, although it went a little bit longer in the UP. And uh, by about 1920, it was over in Wisconsin. And uh, in Minnesota, it went till about 1929 was when uh, the Virginia and Rainy Lake Lumber Company closed, which was the largest white pine sawmill in the world. <clears throat> so basically, uh, you know, the the pine forests that existed at that time were all logged over with it and cut down within a matter of a few decades, you know, so that was a pretty radical change that happened pretty quickly. And then what came in was even more fire after that. Um, after the logging, they left a lot of slash behind and uh, that dried out and became a fire hazard that, you know, people sometimes started by accident or steam trains started. Um, or also, uh, you know, farmers, people coming in to farm, you know, you see the one picture on the right there, people came in to settle and farm it, and they often used fire as a way to clear the land so that they could farm it. And, uh, you know, so there was a lot of big fires, like the, the Peshtigo fire in Wisconsin and the, and the UP in 1871. And uh, numerous other fires in 1871, I guess that was a really dry year. Uh, Wisconsin and Michigan combined, it's estimated over 3 million acres burned in that year alone. Um, in Minnesota, there was, of course, numerous big fires. Uh, Hinkley Fire in 1894, numerous ones after that, and all the way up to the, the Cloquet Moose Lake Fire in 1918. So, well, I should... What that did is, you know, that basically wiped the slate clean, so to speak. And, uh, you know, the big forest was gone and in many places almost looked like a prairie. Uh, I've read stories about near Aiken, Minnesota, where there was so many sharp-tailed grouse that when the flocks flushed, they'd blot out the sun. So I mean, you can imagine what the landscape was like if there was that many sharp-tailed grouse. And so what ended up happening then was, you know, after the big fires, the, the forest started regenerating. And then uh, as people gave up on farming, uh, you know, many of these areas aren't very well suited to farming. There's a short growing season. The, the soil isn't very good. And people tried to farm it and then abandoned it. And we ended up with forest coming back. And it was the forest was pretty much all the same age because... You know, there was these big fires and loggings and stuff that we just talked about. And that was pretty much, you know, left alone that way until, you know, the 60s and 70s when uh, when some timber harvesting started moving back in. But, you know, we're still dealing with the legacy of that to some extent that, uh, you know, much of this area is now forest that's, you know, similar age that all started within a few decades. So... That's all I got. Uh, I'll stop sharing here. There we go. Great. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, and just a reminder for folks, if you have joined us a few minutes late, you can ask questions in the Q&A button. 
and we will um, have Dwayne answer those questions after the second presentation. So we'll move on to Jeff Larkin's presentation. And Jeff is with the Indiana University of Pennsylvania, as well as American Bird Conservancy. And Jeff, you can take it away. So thanks for uh, inviting me to, to, to be a part of this uh, webinar this evening. Um, it's, uh, Great to see so many people in in attendance, and and I hope um, after our our presentations here, we can engage in some conversation about um, the importance of dynamic forests and what that might look like, and the importance of all forest types and forest age classes. So, with that said, I'll I'll begin. <laughs> Most of my work um, is done in the the eastern, more eastern forests than than even um, Minnesota and Wisconsin, but uh, certainly much of what I'm I'm going to be talking about today is um, applicable. I'm not advancing for some reason. How about now? Good, I think so. <laughs> Yep, Anna, can you give me a, a yep it looks that? good Jeff. great thank you appreciate it so eastern forests um we we benefit from living in in eastern forest landscapes uh, i think we all have some kind of an, an affinity and attraction to eastern forests and we know that these places are are wonderfully diverse um ecosystems and we like to spend a lot of time there whether we're a bird hunter or a bird watcher, or just an outdoor enthusiast that likes to go on walks in the forest. We also appreciate the clean water that they provide us. And of course, our rural economies benefit from uh, various forest resources. And we know just as diverse as those forests are and the many um, benefits we gain from them, we also know that those forests are um, under, you know, a daily threat, if you will, pick your pick your new threat, it seems, uh, of the day or the month. And those come in many forms, right? Invasive species, uh, excessive deer browsing in some regions, uh, diseases, conversion to non-forest and fragmentation uh, from non-forest land uses. And of course, uh, kind of that hidden um, Real big issue is uh, unsustainable harvest practices <clears throat> that, um, that that plague much of our our private landscapes. And <clears throat> eastern forest birds are are a group of birds that are telling us, uh, giving us that kind of canary in a coal mine signal that we we must do better in being stewards of our forests. Um, we look at bird population declines over the last fifty years. Eastern forest birds are one of those groups that have exhibited uh, the largest decline. To think about wood thrush, wood thrush in, in, in our current forests, you know, only, only four of, of 10 wood thrush that would have been there 50 years ago are on the landscape. <clears throat> Next, that rings true for, for many species, and we'll touch on a few of those here in a moment. And as long as humans have been in, enjoying wildlife and walking in the forest and in the ad, advance of modern wildlife management, forest birds have been a group that have received quite a bit of attention. And, uh, and there exists uh, no shortage of journals, uh, uh, books, textbooks, uh, articles, you name it, that, uh, that discuss the ecological relationships that forest birds have with forests. And through all of that work, there's basically two, two I guess, aspects of forest bird ecology that, um, that just uh, ring out repeatedly. And the first is this landscape context. Forest birds are birds of landscapes. And, it, and, it's, and it's really odd and ironic that a bird like a golden wing warbler that has a nesting ter a breeding territory of about one acre uh, at most, is influenced by the landscape around it at a much, 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 much larger scale. 
what type of forest? What's the forest configuration? Uh, what's the age class distribution of the forest? And then, of course, the other is the structural complexity of vegetation within those forests, more of a within stand or a site level perspective. And you can see here on the right, all of these are pictures of, from forests. These are all forest pictures, uh, but they all look different, very different, right? Um, but they are, in fact, forests and they are structurally different. And all of those, from a bird perspective, equal niches. So all of these things equal niches, niches, those places that, that each of these species fit into, if you will. And the problem is, you see, these birds are declining. Yeah, there are forces at work that are uh, working against our migratory birds, certainly on the wintering grounds and in migration. But we have a lot of birds that are resident or short distant migrants that don't go anywhere near Central or South America. Uh, and they share the same declining relationship that many of these neotropical migratory birds share. And when we think about the diversity of those bird communities and, and niches and structural complexity and where all of those species kind of fit into the forest landscape, uh, we, we quickly realize the trouble that uh, Duane just articulated in the simplicity of our forests. So those birds co-evolved in landscapes that were both forested and those forests were quite diverse. All of those disturbance factors that Duane touched on and probably many other worked at different scales at both time and space and intensity. And all of the diversity that we have in our forests is the result of some form of disturbance on some gradient of severity and some gradient of return interval. <clears throat> and what happened in our eastern forest that was over a very, very short amount of time, we lost thousands of years of structural complexity in the making to landscape clearing, both for timber uh, resources as well as making it a goal of, of agricultural uh, lifestyles. And we're very fortunate in many parts of the Eastern US where our forests have come back. They've regenerated wonderfully. I live in a state of Pennsylvania with 17 million acres of forest, but most of that forest looks like this. Kind of vanilla uh, in the context of diversity of structure from an age class perspective. Certainly the complexity we get here is kind of going to be driven in this landscape by topography, elevation, aspect, things like that. But relatively speaking, quite probably unlike what it was historically. <laughs> Excuse me. And in fact, when we look at our age class distribution of our forests in the east, uh, in most any eastern state, our age class distribution looks quite a bit like this, where it's skewed toward middle-aged forest. And middle-aged forests are beautiful to walk through, um, but they're relatively boring uh, structurally, right? They're just kind of like in perfect shape. Um, not a whole lot of structural complexity being brought into the mix yet. They're starting to approach an age where that can start to happen, but it's really up in, in these older forests <laughs> that we'll start to see some of those within stand structural complexities. It's important to point out that our forests might have mature trees in them, but there are certainly not mature forests yet. They have a long way to go. <clears throat> and on the other end of the spectrum, we've had a lot of changes to landscape, uh, uh, land use practices, harvest practices, the kinds of things that would have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, affected the structural complexity and made more young forest structure on the landscape. Remember all those beavers are gone as well. But we have, quote, too much of this middle-aged forest and not enough of the bookends. And it's not surprise, It's not, not a surprise that, of course, species like cerulean warbler on one end of the books of, of, uh, bookend, and then golden wing warblers and woodcock and rough grouse on the other end tend to be species that are uh, most of most concern here in the eastern states. And then we take this 
backdrop of even aged forests dominating the landscape. So limited amounts of structural complexity, limited niches, if you will. And we compi uh, compile or uh, compound on top of that um, unsustainable timber harvests, diameter limit cuts being the, the harvest uh, preference of the day. We see very little regeneration harvests uh, like we see on the bottom. And again, this changes um, from place to place depending on the forest uh, communities that are uh, that are being managed. But in my part of the world where it's oak, mostly oak silviculture, northern hardwood silviculture, regeneration harvests are quite uncommon. Now, of course, we have those invasive species of the day, and then in places where we have overabundant deer populations that influence the regeneration or the likelihood of a, of a stand to be able to regenerate, whether it's after a timber harvest, a wildfire, or some other natural disturbance. Deer are a force on the landscape. <clears throat> all affecting, uh, all of these things affecting uh, reduction of, of structural complexity. We've done a lot of work. Uh, we, as in the scientific community, have done a lot of work over the over the last several decades, especially as technology has allowed us to use small nanotechnology to uh, dig deep into the hidden lives of birds. And we know we know more now uh, in the last twenty years than than of course those uh, well many decades before because of our ability to use that technology. And we used to be happy just understanding and content understanding the. The, the survival of nests and density of breeding birds. And in more recent years, we've been able to use those tags to follow birds across landscapes after they leave their nests, to learn a little bit more about an important part of uh, our, our avifauna's uh, annual cycle. And we, we've learned most is that it's more than about nests and, and nest density uh, and nestlings. It's the secret life, the post-fledging life of birds that we have learned a great deal about and really gives us that indication of why that bird who has that one acre breeding nesting territory is, is seemingly influenced by large landscapes of forests way beyond the bounds of its defended territory. So we have a golden wing warbler that was a couple of them there that are transmitted just days before they're ready to leave their nest in a regenerating timber harvest in Pennsylvania. And you can see that uh, young fledgling on the right side and the blue dot indicates <clears throat> where its nest was, where it hatched out of an egg. <clears throat> and all of these yellow dots indicate daily locations of this bird over about the first 30 days of its life before the telemetry unit failed. So it's in an overstory removal or a clear cut with residuals or legacy trees. Once it's able to move a little bit more, it moves up into a shelter wood, which is a form of oak silviculture, one of the intermediate steps in oak silviculture. And then it moved into about a 25 year old overstory removal. And you see this in a 30, uh, 30 day period, it used quite a bit of different forest types and, and structural complexities uh, within those types, different conditions. And that bird, of course, <clears throat> survived uh, to be independent. And so the battery failed and, and we can only assume had a good shot of, of making it uh, down to South America and, and returning and establishing a territory the next year. We did a similar study for cerulean warblers in the Allegheny National Forest. Um, a cerulean warbler um, having, uh, of course, an affinity for older, mature forests with gaps of so some form of a, a disturbance-dependent species, but not of the degree of the of the golden wing warbler. And what we saw with those individuals that we tagged is that they they still followed um, disturbances along the landscape after they left the nest. They walked, or they they worked across the top of uh, of this um, unharvested portion of the forest just off of a, a regenerating timber harvest. Then they this bird actually worked down a forest road, a gap created by the forest road. And then we lost it for a day. And then we found it actually down in these clear cuts um, just to the to the south, 25 year old clear cuts. So can all think about what those forests look like for a species that was born in 
in a, or hatched out of an egg in a nest way in the top of a, a big white oak tree. <clears throat> Point being here is that um, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot that where a bird puts its nest, the first view that a nestling gets of the world looks quite different from where they are foraging, learning how to evade predators, molting into what looks like adults and getting ready to make their first migration to Central and South America. So we need to be thinking about managing forest landscapes in a way that takes into account these full reproductive season habitat needs. And for a golden wing warbler, it's bigger than just that black dot where it placed its nests. It needs an area of complex forest of different age classes and structural complexities. It's no different than the cerulean warbler that moves a little bit further after that, you know, for those fir first 30 days. And those are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about in the context of managing for the recovery of these species, not just what they nest in, but what they need in order to make it past that first 30 days of life to get to that point of independence. Think about that as a mosaic of, you know, in, a, in, in active forest management kind of context. Um, it's a mosaic of forest management activities of different intensities. And it's important to think about that. It's not just about regeneration forestry. It's just not about young forest. It's not just about old forest. It's about all ages of forest to meet the diverse habitat needs of these species. And the diverse habitat needs of diverse bird communities, uh, that. And it's not just cerulean warblers and golden wing warblers that you know, provide this same picture. We have plenty of researchers that have reported similar results for like wood thrush, a few papers out there on wood thrush over the last 20 years that point to this reoccurring theme of mosaics. Same for whippoorwill. And in fact, other taxa beyond birds, native pollinators, bats, mesocarnivores, almost all of these, and you can see some of the studies uh, citations to the right, almost all of these papers that are, report the importance of heterogeneous landscapes have a very similar ending, a conclusion, and this one, for example. However, it is apparent from a number of studies that these three species may benefit from heterogeneous forest landscapes, such as those created by active forest management, when heterogeneity encompasses forest type, age, and structural characteristics. It's a mouthful, but that's a really actually beautifully articulated um, message for managers that are often seeking from wildlife biologists the kinds of information that will help them create the conditions to benefit wildlife. And in fact, it's not just wildlife biologists that are talking about the importance of balancing age classes. If we look at most any uh, state forest action plan in the eastern U.S., um, they come across uh, the, the language of balancing age classes and, and unbalanced age classes posing a threat to the resiliency of their forests. It's quote similar to this occur uh, time and time again throughout many of our uh, forest action plans, which is kind of the forestry equivalent of the state wildlife action plan. They're done on the revised every 10 years. So it's not just wildlife, it's forests, and we know it's an important part of forest health. As this quote in the science article in 2015 uh, provides quite a, it provides quite a nice uh, synopsis of, of what I've just basically spoke about for the last 15 minutes. Structural complexity, diversity of niches, all of that important for forest health, for resiliency, and for diverse and thriving wildlife. What's good for the forest is good for forest wildlife. There is no doubt. The science is strong in that. And in this 
battle to create wonderful conditions across our forested landscapes. We have uh, a great group of professionals out on the landscape that can help us do this. They, they, they know what to do. They know the threats. The forest science is out there. It's well articulated in BMPs and textbooks. It's just making sure that foresters have all the tools in the toolbox available to them to be able to create the conditions at biologically meaningful scales. Biologically meaningful scales to thriving, abundant forest wildlife. Takes money, sometimes lots of money because the challenges are real, but the outcomes can be uh, quite wonderful quite positive, like this regenerating oak forest that's literally polluted with oak regeneration. Or this forest that had just a little bit of love given to it, just a forest stand improvement, prescribed fire. It's not intended to be regenerated at all. But the next time spongy moth comes through and affects those canopy trees, I feel a whole lot more confident that this forest is going to become an oak forest again than I would have just a few years prior to this treatment. And it's important to think, you know, we could think about letting all of our, our forests become older naturally. And certainly many of our, our acres of forests are gonna continue along that, that, uh, that progression to be older forests that become structurally complex on their own. But certainly many of our forest wildlife species do not have time for us to wait for our forests for another hundred years to get to the structural complexity that they need to. When we look at the population declines of the, of the cerulean warbler on the left and the golden wing warbler on the right, the bottom of that X axis is lights out, folks. It's extinction, gone. And that's a 40 year trend line that you're seeing on both of those. There is not another 100 years to wait for these species to, to be able to recover to, to some kind of a safer population level. We actually need to be better stewards of our lands, of our forests, if we are going to see many of these species exist into the, the long-term future. We do that by two things. We got to keep forests on the landscape. Forest birds need forests. We've got to limit the amount of conversion and fragmentation, but we've also got to be better stewards. And, and being a better steward can sometimes look ugly at first. Sometimes there's some things that need to be done to our forests that are going to help it become structurally complex a little bit sooner than if we just let it be providing some opportunities for more desired species. And some of the steps we take are more intense and some of them are more uh, non-commercial based, a little bit less intense. Some of them are make you scratch your head at first if you're the unknowing. To many people, a walk through this forest of fern, knee-high fern is just a wonderful day in the forest, but to a trained Professional, we know that a forest like this is quite uh, non-resilient. And sometimes we have to do some things like this, which is an herbicide application to control something like hay scented fern. And in time, we can see that that becomes a wonderfully regenerating forest that has the likelihood of becoming a forest again, should a disturbance event, uh, an unexpected disturbance event, strike that particular acre of forest. So here's our canvas. When we think about our canvas, we've got uh, private forest lands on the landscape and public forest lands on the landscape and both play really important roles. But the one thing we cannot escape is the fact that partnerships are hugely important in turning the tide of our structurally simplified forests and declining wildlife populations. All of those funds that are necessary and the technical expertise that are needed to be able to right the ship uh, comes from strong partnerships, or at least it's made a whole lot easier, easier um, from, from an implementation perspective. 
Um, private lands is hugely important. It is the lion's share of the forest on our landscape. So when we have great partners like NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, that have programs like Working Lands for Wildlife and Regional Conservation Partnerships uh, programs that provide funding for technical and financial assistance to landowners to implement good, strong forestry practices on their lands. It's a win-win for wildlife and landowners and certainly the conservation biologists and wildlife biologists that are trying to recover wildlife populations that need private land um, stewardship just as much as public land stewardship. And uh, you were at the beginning of this webinar, you were introduced to some of the, the foresters, uh, ABC's foresters in the, in the Western Great Lakes states. And they work through the Regional uh, Conservation Partnership Program, which is very similar to the Working Lands for Wildlife Program, where they provide technical uh, assistance to landowners interested in doing good things for their forest. And it, it starts with a conversation, a meeting, talking about objectives. What are the landowners' objectives? Do they dovetail nicely with the RCPP or Working Lands for Wildlife? Moving forward, collecting silvicultural data, helping with the implementation, the stand boundary marking, for example, working with uh, habitat contractors and the private landowners and the technical assistance uh, provider, a forester, watching to make sure that the work gets done as according to the plan. And then, of course, sitting back after it's all done and watching it become wonderfully regenerating healthy forests. Think about what this forest will look like in 15 years with all of those legacy trees overtopping a nice regeneration later. Think about what that forest looks like 50 years from now. We're starting to see how we get more structural complexity into our forests. We're very fortunate with Working Lands for Wildlife just in the state that I work most in since 2012, about 16,000 acres of forest has been made better, uh, private land forest has been made better through working lands for wildlife. And we don't have golden wing warbler near as common as you folks do in many parts of Minnesota and Northern Wisconsin. Um, and we're, we're battling to keep golden wing warbler, warbler on our landscape. And we're thrilled when we see 50% or, or I'm sorry, 30% occupancy of the stands that we treat in, in the Appalachian states. Um, for a species that's being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act, knowing that we've created habitat that's resulted in, in occupancy at a 30% rate is pretty good. And we learn about where those birds are occupying and how we might be able to do better in targeting the lands that we actually implement these forest management practices on. And one thing that we learned uh, also is that the distance to uh, known uh, population is really important. If if a habitat, it could look just perfectly great, but if it's more than 20 miles away from a known site, the likelihood of it being occupied was zero. In fact, 99% of our known, uh, of our sites were within 8.5 miles of a known golden wing warbler um, breeding site. This is where public lands comes into play. Public lands provide wonderful acre point, anchor points, and they have a certain amount of resources available to them. So there are not only just large contiguous blocks of forests, but they have um, agency foresters that generally are out there working the landscape, doing inventories, implementing forest management. They have existing forest management plans. They're implementing those plans with a base amount of budget. So when we think about private lands that might be scattered across space and time, we think about putting those on landscapes that are anchored with public, larger public land blocks. And those blocks are managed in a way that creates a continuous amount of, of, of young forest, in this case, for our friend, the golden wing warbler. It could be a cerulean warbler, a scarlet tanager. Pick your, pick your favorite bird <clears throat> in your favorite age class of forest. Um, it's that kind of a landscape that adds that structural complexity, that mosaic, if you will, uh, on the landscape 
and gives us synergy between the public and the private lands conservation efforts that are currently underway. But remember, remember the trick here is that we have structurally simplified forests, even on our public lands. Even on our public lands, we have this unbalanced age class. So those public lands need attention as well. It's not just the private forest lands that need more work to get diversity on the landscape. As we say, diversity begets diversity. We're very fortunate in this, uh, this part of the world where we have a couple of National Fish and Wildlife Foundation programs that are uh, giving us a lot of that extra uh, funding needed to create uh, conditions that are diversified. We call them um, dynamic forests and we have a dynamic forest partnership. And in Pennsylvania, it stretches across three really important uh, areas of the state. And these are birdscapes in Pennsylvania. And then you can see these blocks, the black polygons. Those are dynamic forest blocks. And uh, those are areas that we are actively managing to create mosaics of uh, forest age classes and disturbances. Um, and again, it's a focus not just on young forest and rotational forestry, we really go through a planning process that identifies where we're going to have the late serial stage forest on our landscape. Where are we going to have that mixed middle age class forest? And where are we going to have 15% young forest on our landscape? And how are we going to do this in perpetuity? And that's why there's lots of flexibility in those percentages that you see in the bottom left, is that every landscape's a little different and every landscape we're going to be able to pursue our civil cultural goals a little bit and objectives differently. But this takes time. Make no mistake about it. Uh, look, in 15 years, we've only go for to about 4.6% of the zero to five year old forest. We never, we don't, we still don't have any in the six to 20 and 21 to 39 year old forest. And look at that 40 to 80 year old forest uh, in 2020 goes to 1.4%. Well, why is that? It goes, it's because most of our forest is aging to the older uh, age class of 81 to 125. <clears throat> it's not until maybe the next 15 year cycle that we'll start to see a little bit more balance to our age classes. But this is work that will span multiple careers. <clears throat> There's no doubt about it. We monitor in these, uh, these areas. <clears throat> We monitor to understand focal bird species uh, baseline and then uh, the communities. And I don't have an awful lot of time to, to go over that in detail, but most of our efforts beyond monitoring is spent actually implementing various forest management practices across those landscapes. And we were very fortunate to have private lands uh, uh, groups with easements and such uh, request to be members of our dynamic forest partnership in recent years. This is just one of those birdscapes, the Poconos birdscapes, and shows you the active dynamic forest blocks that we have uh, in place currently. Those blocks that have been uh, in the program longest have experienced the benefits of additional funding to be able to do um, some of this work. And this work uh, is demonstrated here in orange, but most of that is forest and improvement activities, prescribed fire, low shade removals, fern or invasive species treatments. Um, we're not quite where we need to be in these forests to be able to rotate or regenerate some of them. We have to address many, many risks that uh, disallow us to do that. But here is some recent LIDAR that kind of shows you, uh, this is from our, our uh, Pennsylvania uh, forests, shows you a little bit of that structural complexity that can happen when you put some um, silvicultural uh, timber harvests and such on the landscape where we have overstory removals that are young here, <clears throat> overstory removal that's a little bit older. And you can see the LIDAR picking up the regeneration layer in this forest. Two very different types of bird communities occupying. And then of course, the lion share still being a mature intact forest with an older, regenerating forest in the background. <clears throat> we've got about 38,000 acres of forest management that we've done since 2012 through our RCPP, our Working Lands for Wildlife and our Dynamic Forest Partnership. And, it, and I should point out that we've got thousands more to go because we're really cooking now with our Dynamic Forest Partnership program 
with over 320,000 acres in the program now, um, we're looking for that to, to, to continue to grow. Thousands of acres that have been planned to have treatments and, and quality stewardship applied to them. And I would just leave everyone with, with, these, with this last slide. And, and it's a slide of hope. I know we've had a little bit of gloom and doom with declining populations and all the work that's ahead of us. But if we think about population recoveries of wildlife that have been habitat-based, and we think about waterfowl wetland restoration that came in the 80s, and we look at one of those groups that has been splendidly um, recovering quite nicely, one of our shining examples of how habitat management, when we put our minds to it and we restore places and we manage places better, communities better, bird populations can respond. You know. We should be grateful that folks didn't have, um, you know, the idea of quitting uh, Kirtland Warbler conservation and management somewhere in this area. And we see the results of, of management on the landscape and what that has done for the removal of that species from the endangered species list. And I think the same is going to happen for Eastern forest birds. It's going to take a while. The challenges are strong. They're huge. They're powerful, um, but I think our power, uh, the power of our partnerships can be just as strong. Um, and we have to, to come to agree that um, we cherish all of our forest age classes and having all of those forest age classes and levels and spectrums of diversity and disturbance on the landscape is, is important. And it's challenging to achieve that, but together I think we certainly can. I don't know the timeline though. I just know that it's not here yet and we've got a lot more work to do. So I will uh, stop there and take any questions that anyone might have. Thank you, Jeff. That was a very thorough covering of dynamic forests. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came in during your presentation. <clears throat> um, and I'll just read them out loud here. They are in the Q&A box and others feel free to answer or to ask additional questions. Um, also, as soon as I ask Jeff this question, I am going to hit start on that poll. So if you do uh, wish to receive continuing education credits, you can answer that poll and we'll make sure that those get to you. Um, so Jeff, um, here's a question. In regions of intense deer browse, what advice would you give landowners who want to create early successional habitat? Oh. With respect to de uh, excessive deer browse, um, it is our number one challenge. I mean, I'm not going to lie; it's a, it, it's a challenge whether you're in Minnesota or if you're in in New Jersey. It doesn't matter. Um, you have to have a plan. You have to have a plan in place and and understand whether or not you actually can 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 successfully regenerate a forest in the presence of deer. Um, and it's not as easy as shooting many, you know, more deer, because we know that that's not necessarily, you know, deer are a landscape issue as well. Um, you can <clears throat> you can see what resources are available to you for um, for mitigating uh, deer damage. We here in Pennsylvania do utilize a fair bit of uh, exclusion fencing in our in our projects, and. Um, and, and it's costly, um, but um, it's it's something that's it's it's a it's a practice that we have great success with, um, and and I think that I think that one of the challenges we face with respect to deer fencing is taking it down um, when it still has when that stand will still have value to the to to wildlife. I think that's the one thing we need to get a little bit better at. As soon as that, as soon as that regeneration layer gets uh, atop the deer uh, browse line, then you should take that fence down because it provides wonderful opportunities, the lateral foliage uh, browsing that deer would have. Um, and of course, um, generally landowners want to do something like hunt on their, their, uh, their properties. And certainly a, a tall fence um, inhibits that for a few years, but uh, it's it's not easy. It's it's a it's probably the biggest challenge that I feel most hopeless about. That's a tough one. 
Thanks for giving yeah. some of your insight. We have a couple more questions here. I'm going to hit launch real quick on the continuing education credit poll. Um, so folks can go ahead and start answering that. Um, our next question is about oaks and oak regeneration. Um, what oak seedling types would you suggest for regeneration of cutover, for example, red oak acres, given the effects of climate change in 50 to 100 years? So kind of thinking along the lines of what mm. other southern tree species might thrive in that 50 to 100 year period from now in northern Wisconsin? Mm. Well, it's a very good question. <clears throat> I think I would, I think I would <clears throat> a not be the person that would 100% be able to answer that one most effectively. I think that's, that's going to be someone with a, a little bit more of a, a tree physiology and other kind of expertise. But I think you just look for oaks, oaks a little bit further to the south of you. And, um, and I would probably, I would actually, if it were me uh, and, and or a landowner and, and interested in this, I would probably, I would probably hedge my bets on just being diverse in what I put on my lands so that something actually uh, wins the, wins the race at the end of the day. Yeah, thanks. And I think we'll put a, a link in the chat here in a minute of um, a link to the Northern Institute for Applied Climate Science because they have some really great resources there. Um, another question uh, for either of our presenters is at what scale or percent acreage does this disturbance become fragmentation for mature forest species? It depends on what mature forest species you're you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> certainly, um, Certainly, there are a lot of mature forest nesting species that actually use younger forest age classes, different structural conditions beyond uh, mature forest. But that's some, um, you know, that's a species specific question. And that's a species specific research question uh, at the end of the day. Um, all species have some um, of their of, of their own thresholds of those kinds of disturbances. Uh, but you can call it fragmentation of mature forests, but certainly we know that that fragmentation is going to be quite fleeting in the context of, of, the, of forests and, and forest age. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Um, there's another question. How important is it in having a healthy forest industry for recovering these species, assuming we're talking about recovering these bird species? Well, I, I can speak to that. I think it's <clears throat> immensely important, um, more important than, than folks can imagine. Um, I'll give you a great example of, you know, a, a low, a, a low grade market, for example, is, is hugely important um, because a, 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 a lot of times some of that forest and improvement work that we need to do starts with the removal of, of low quality materials, right? Low grade volume. And if you don't have that market, then you have to pay for that. That's something that you pay for instead of gaining something from. And we see that. <clears throat> we see that in portions of Appalachians where that, that low grade market has vanished through from, from many, many landscapes. So then what you're left with is a saw market log or a saw log market. That's it. Right? So what land what choices do landowners have for harvesting on their lands? The market that is open to them is saw log. So what gets taken? Saw logs. And what gets left? The crap. So that everyone has a wonderful same age forest as when they started, a wonderfully high graded forest of crooked, bent, loaded, undesirable species, a very un, un, unresilient forest, uh, and a lot of work for the next forest owner to fix that forest, if they can fix it. It's probably a reset and pray. Timber, timber industry is hugely important to, 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 to making forest stewardship as much as it can be. Yeah, and Jeff, we have a couple more questions here. Um, I'm going to ask one 
uh, related to fire. Um, can prescribed fire be used to replace timber harvesting in implementing a dynamic forest concept? I think it can. <clears throat> I think it can in um, for many practices for sure. I I'd say except for the most extreme disturbance events, right? I think if I think if you have canopy dying trees dying in the canopy from your prescribed fire, that something has gone wrong. Um, so there's going to be you know if we think about every every bit of structural complexity in our forest is the result of disturbance. I mean, disturbance is what makes forest structurally complex. It's just the return interval on the disturbance and the intensity of the disturbance. So I think prescribed fire can get you a lot of those. You know, it can check a lot of those boxes, but there's still going to be some active management that's going to need to be taken in order to, to achieve some of those maybe setting the stage. Now, maybe you do a, maybe you do a, a, a variable density thinning, right? And you get, you get this stand that has this this it's it's kind of you've done this you've done this mechanically you maybe do it through a timber harvest but you've set the stage for the can it be to be what it is going to be and then you manage it with prescribed fire right so the first step in getting the kind of the canopy um, structural complexity you're looking for and the gappiness of it that comes through mechanical means following through uh, repeated you know management periodically to get us to um, with, with, with prescribed fire to get us to the long-term structural complexity that we're looking for. There's a question about the German Icarus initiative. Is this something that, um, Jeff or any of our other panels here, uh, have looked at to track birds to their winter habitat so we can better understand those impacts? I'm sorry, what was the... It's the German Icarus Initiative. It's uh, not something I have heard of before. No, yeah, I'm not familiar. Um, it might, I wonder if, if the person asking the question, um, we do generally speaking with our, our North American bird habitat initiatives and monitoring, we do take into effect full life cycle impacts. So there are mm. paired research looking at wintering and stopover migratory habitats as well. Yes, I'm sorry. We are active in we are active in Central and South America on conserving and restoring uh, bird habitat for neotropical migratory birds, and I actually have a I actually have a, a graduate student from Honduran uh, from Honduras currently who is working in uh, in uh, integrated open canopy coffee systems, uh, looking at sustainability of of coffee uh, coffee production in, in birds. Well, I think we've, we might have a few more questions. We'll try to answer those um, after the webinar, but it is past um, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. And we really appreciate everybody taking the time to join us today. Thank you both Dwayne and Jeff for your presentations. Um, again, we will have a recording link uh, sent out soon after we wrap up this webinar and um, uh, Jeff or Duane, you have any final final things you want to say? I, I, I think maybe I would just say that I'm looking at the chat. I think Brian may be um, talking about the MODIS initiative, MODIS tagging with the towers and such. And we are um, we are in we are involved with that as well. And uh, we have several species that we've um, we've been putting MODIS tags on uh, uh, and partnering with others that are that are doing similar work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And have a good evening.